about myself. Uh, so my mother's side, we have some um, well-known intellectuals, philosophers, even, uh, God forbid, uh, continental philosophers and postmodernists. But my father was, an, uh, well, he's an engineer, and my grandfather was an accountant. So I think I, in my research, I try to address some of the questions, the kind of philosophical, cultural questions that were addressed here, but in a very practical, scientific, and te technological way. Okay, so this is what I will, today I will try to represent uh, this side, the practical side. Um, so I think you may be familiar with, oh, okay, let me get back to this. So I was trying to, so my goal today is, and we'll probably make it fast, is to try to uh, take this notion of exterritorial technology and try to make it concrete in terms of uh, things that are going around us today. So the first associations would be, of course, the uh, Hakim Bey and um, you know cyberpunk uh, literature like uh, Neuromancer and Snow Crash, Rooster and Islands in the Stream. Not sure if you're familiar with all, but I would assume you are some are familiar with some of the kind of uh, uh, cyberpunk literature and ideas of building cyberspace. Now. And that would, of course, challenge these notions of space uh, and territory as we know them today. Now, so if we look, but if we look, you know, I, again, I'm trying to be practical. I want to see it happening now, or I want to see if it's tangible. I don't want to just uh, talk about it and fantasize it about it like they do in fiction, but we want to actually build it. Now, if you look around, there are very interesting things going around, but we think they are still not, um, they're still not there. So we have looked at things like Second Life, which is kind of the closest, the closest thing to um, to uh, cyberpunk uh, happening today. It was quite popular five years ago, still happening. Very interesting to study as a sociological phenomenon. A lot of uh, very interesting things going on. In this image, there is a, a, a lady giving birth in Second Life to a virtual baby. Um, but these are still kind of arguably video games. These are still um, these are st still not visceral enough. These are still not uh, real uh, substitutes for uh, meaningful uh, experiences in life, right? It's still kind of a, a game for kids. And uh, but in the lab in the laboratories, you know, with neuroscience, with technology, material sciences, next generations are being now uh, cooked. And you saw in uh, Mayan's, uh, Mayan and Wuti's uh, video, one example, I'll show you stuff from the stuff that we are doing. So my research group, uh, I call it the Advanced Virtuality Lab because it's kind of an ambiguous name and we can do whatever we feel at the time. Um, and right now we're working mostly on uh, brain-computer interface. Um, so we have uh, several people, we have uh, very uh, multidisciplinary, a lot of technologies, but also uh, we even had a philosopher or two, but kind of uh, more, again, uh, we're more uh, looking at things practically, which means technology, science, uh, psychology would be experimental rather than uh, uh, qualitative. And we have, uh, okay, the advantage of being practical is we get uh, actual funding to build stuff. So we have uh, quite a few uh, international research projects. Which, if you glimpse on the net, I won't have time to get into everything, but you see that um, one project, one large uh, European project is called Beaming. It's about telepresence. I'll say a few words about that. Another one is uh, virtual embodiment and robotic re-embodiment. And we, have a, we even have a project that I will not talk about today, which is about fostering free will. But again, this is not philosophy. This is neuroscience. Okay? Um, okay, so Mayan asked for a brief history of uh, telepresence. How about that? Where is Mayan? Maybe two minutes. So telepresence is uh, a coin uh, was coined by uh, Marvin Minsky. Marvin Minsky, for those who don't know, is kind of the Einstein of or the Chomsky of uh, artificial intelligence. Okay, I mean there's a lot of uh, famous figures in AI. Marvin Minsky is maybe number one, and uh, I think this was 1980. They were building these uh, robots that were controlled. I mean what you see now is contemporary. This is uh, equipment from our partners, but in the 80s they already had some crude versions of this stuff where you have one person wearing all kinds of devices and gadgets experiencing the world through a remote uh, embodiment, through a robot, and this is of course both a sensory uh, experience 
you uh, look through, you see another world through the eyes of the robot, you hear through the microphones on the robot, sometimes you feel touch, and you can manipulate objects by uh, moving your hands, and the uh, action is taken by the robot. So uh, this is kind of the science and technology of uh, dissociating mind and body and allowing for a remote uh, a visceral experiences. And uh, in the 1990s, this was, uh, well, telepresence research has not stopped, but there has been work on something called presence, where the notion was that, you know what, it's not only about... Uh, connecting your brain or your mind to artificial, to remotely, uh, sti to remote stimuli, but also to create, to connect your brain to artificially generated stimuli, i.e. Uh, virtual reality. And uh, so there has been some uh, work uh, uh, in trying to conceptualize what it is this experience. Uh, sometimes I think in, in cinema or in television, you would call it suspension of disbelief. But this is, a, this is a kind of a more generic term because it would include also the possibility to act in the scene. Not just to feel as if you are there, but to also be able to change, to manipulate uh, that space. So there has been all kinds of definitions like the sense of being there, a perceptual illusion of non-mediation, a mental state in which a user feels physically present within the computer-mediated environment. So people try to quantify it, measure it using uh, questionnaires, uh, try to come up with a science of... Uh, of presence in, in departments like psychology, communications, and also a little bit in uh, engineering and computer science. So it's kind of uh, psychophysics. So this, of course, is, uh, you know, um, what they tell me, what my friend, the historian, tells me is that this projection, I don't know, uh, maybe you guys know better than me, but my understanding is that this urban legend about the first projector, uh, projection of the Lumiere brothers in Paris uh, people actually ran away from the coming train. It's not uh, an urban legend, but uh, it's written in some books that it's an urban legend. One of my historian friends said, no, it really did happen. Okay, so this is what we mean by presence. It's not just uh, getting engaged by, a, by an art piece or, a, or a, a movie. It's actually acting as if you are there. It's very different from engagement, okay? Because you could be very distant, you could be very bored, as you might be in some uh, lectures, and still be present, okay? Um, so in this case, people actually ran away and acted to the to the media, and this happens today in all kinds of uh, virtual reality experiments that uh, my colleagues have done. Um, for example, in this, this is like a classic study that has been, has been repeated uh, several times, where subjects are uh, um, induced a sense of fear of height, and you see it's kind of a, not only a, a, a audiovisual experience but also. You, s you actually stand on a small piece of wood, which does a uh, large part of the trick by feeling that you're on a ledge. And uh, you can also quantify the fear of height, and people get away, some people would get away from it. You see accelerated heartbeats, etc., etc. Uh, so, this is a, a little bit about the history of presence. Um, in fact, in fact, I was going to show, okay, I'm missing one slide for some reason, but. Uh, I don't know if we have time, I can refer you to some uh, examples of, uh, of presence research. Now, I joined this community about seven or eight years ago, and I personally wasn't very happy with these kind of definitions. And this is where uh, the colleagues, uh, my, my colleagues in London, where I started working with, uh, with a group in London, still working with this group in Europe, we said that instead of using uh, subjective measurements, we start uh, exploring the brain. You know, how does your brain construct reality? How can we measure uh, through a, a brain activity whether you are feeling present or not? And this is where we started working with uh, all kinds of uh, neuroscientists. And we have some ongoing projects, which I'll go over very briefly. Um, so the uh, beaming is uh, the practical part. Okay? This is supposed to be kind of viable in a few years. Um, a lot of the, the things that we're trying to do there. You know, we thought about it when we wrote the proposal as kind of science fiction, you know, but uh, we see that uh, some, some people think that, that, that we, we are ready for it. <coughs> so the idea is that there's all kinds of companies now renting for businessmen all these robots that you can uh, use to represent you in remote meetings, uh, uh, business exhibitions, work meetings. You kind of use your machine, you know, your laptop to, to Skype, 
and uh, your friends would uh, communicate to, uh, to you through your embodiment as a robot. And this is the kind of things that we are uh, building in Beaming. Um, and specifically in IDC in my group, so we say if Beaming using again, so um, <coughs> again, I'm trying to make it uh, simple and, uh, and fast, and I, I'm afraid we're losing uh, some of the stuff, so let me get back here. So if you look at the two uh, rightmost pictures, at the center top and the right top, so this person is, uh, so it's an asymmetric uh, technology or asymmetric setup. The idea is to uh, beam people into a physical space. This is different from the, the cyberspace uh, version of you know, Second Life or the Matrix or virtual reality. So we have a physical space. We beam it up. For example, if you wanted to beam someone here, we would install all kinds of high quality cameras, microphones, try to capture the space in 3D in a with a high quality uh, fidelity and in a way that would be unobtrusive to us and then the person at the other side of the world would be able to experience it uh, in a way that would be significantly better than a, a video conference by first of all being able to see everything from every possible angle because we have constructed a 3D representation of the space so it's not only just watching the, the 2D image of the camera it's being able to navigate in the space and also using haptics technology which means vir uh, remote touch or virtual touch the uh, person, the remote person, would be able to touch people, maybe shake hands, uh, manipulate objects that are uh, found here, etc. Um, and there are all kinds of demos, videos online, and uh, in uh, in my group, uh, we are responsible for a subset of this large project, where which is about better than being there. You know, if beaming is about allowing you to be there then we say, okay, if we spent all these millions of euros on building this technology, uh, well, maybe we can make it better. Maybe we can uh, do, um, make you look nicer than you are, maybe manipulate your uh, nonverbal communication skills so that you, are, you appear much more uh, fluent, assertive, or you make the right impression. Uh, there's colleagues of mine in, in Tel Aviv University who created an automatic beautifier, you know, where people wouldn't recognize the manipulation, but you would be... Actually, this works for women very well. This does not work for men, okay? For some reason, it's uh, so you can do all kinds of manipulations, and you can also do something which is our main work, which is uh, you don't really have to really be there. And this is where we get into this distributed uh, entities and distributed uh, or hybrid man-machine uh, entities. So you know, you could be there, beaming using all kinds of technologies. You could send a completely automated representation which looks like you, behaves a bit like you, tries to represent you in that uh, context. I did already send the proxy to replace me in a, a lecture. And this is uh, what I'm showing here in this image. And there are all, all, all kinds of very interesting possibilities in the middle. You know, I could be speaking uh, on a phone and my representation would be kind of uh, filling in the gaps automatically deducing what kind of nonverbal language to use, uh, could uh, do all kinds of things beh on behalf of my report. So it's kind of a split control of this remote representation. We're playing around with these uh, representations. I'll, uh, I think I'll try to show you a video. Do we have an internet connection? Okay, you know what, we'll skip this video, but I would want to show you some videos about the brain, okay? So this is all stuff that you can find online in our in, in our uh, website, and uh, we'll get to the to the really um, interesting stuff. This is uh, not my work. Most of the stuff that I'm sh showing is stuff that we do. This is uh, uh, one of the most interesting research groups. This is my former boss in London. I moved to Barcelona, Mel Slater. So Mel Slater is one of the leaders in presence research and virtual reality research. Uh, it would be an injustice to describe the work that he's been doing for 10, 20, 30 years on virtual reality. But, for example, uh, in this uh, particular setup that you see, the idea is to... So, there are known results from uh, neuroscience that you can create what we call a deep embodiment. It's not just a metaphoric embodiment of like a kid playing a video game and uh, playing with an avatar. There's all kinds of tricks you can do without the uh, intrusive technology that Mayan and Wuti did just by synchronously tapping your body with a, a virtual uh, arm or a virtual body, 
you can fool your brain to have a very um, strong illusion of uh, that your body is the virtual body. Okay, you synchronize, you synchronously tap or touch your body, and you see a virtual body touched at the same time at the same place. And after a few minutes, you, you have a very strong sense of embodiment, and there are paradigms to explore this scientifically. Of course, how do you explore this scientifically? You start threatening the virtual body. You stab it with a knife, you apply all kinds of uh, 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 harmful manipulations, and then you can measure the uh, levels of stress response, and you can co compare all kinds of conditions. So it's now a very popular uh, experimental paradigm in top neuroscience uh, and uh, uh, biomedical uh, labs. <coughs> you can see all kinds of uh, distinguished professors torturing virtual avatars in all kinds of configurations. In this particular setup, uh, this is a person, I think it's me, looking, uh, so I'm wearing a tactile jet, a uh, vest, meaning that I'm, uh, I feel the touch where, what I see is what you see on the left, there's a tennis ball hovering around, and whenever the tennis ball touches my virtual body, I look down, this is a immersive virtual reality, so you look down and you see your belly, you have a very big belly, that's fine, uh, and uh, you feel this tennis ball, Exactly when it touches your belly, you feel it. And then after a few minutes, it really works. And you feel inside your body. And then you have this umbilic cord that kind of uh, um, leaves your body and steps into the body which is in front of you, another body. And this is part of an ongoing uh, race uh, held up at very uh, serious labs, trying to induce a very powerful out-of-body experience. There are some uh, reported... Uh, 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 positive results uh, in this case where people have been induced with a very strong uh, visceral out-of-body experience. However, Mel Slater, for example, if you ask him, he doesn't believe his report because he's never been able, although he uses the best technology and with a lot of details, with a lot of attention to details, he's never been able to reproduce this uh, full-body uh, illusion result. So this is part of the ongoing debate. Okay, now, uh, for me in the last few years, uh, the most uh, exciting development was the possibility to do a brain-computer interface. So basically to control machines directly by thought. Um, it is on the one hand uh, limited, but it is possible. So the idea is using all kinds of techniques which are of course being developed and, and uh, elaborated as we speak. There are all kinds of ways to measure brain activity and the idea is to map this uh, to try to recognize something out of your brain activity and to map it to, to all kinds of applications. Uh, of course, this is mostly used for paralyzed patients to allow them to regain control of their environment, control a wheelchair, control a prosthetic arm. Uh, there is a very, uh, uh, well, a kind of recent result where uh, uh, scientists have been able to use similar techniques to talk with uh, coma patients, and it turned out that some percentage of coma patients are actually uh, able to answer uh, very elaborate questions by, so basically uh, the first one was found kind of by chance, she was a tennis player, and they asked her questions and they told her, look, if you want to say yes, she's a coma patient, you see a person that externally looks completely unconscious, this is Adrian's work, Adrian Owen's work, so he asked her, if you want to say yes, think about playing tennis, if you want to say no, imagine uh, your spouse, and uh, very clearly you can see that in the right places you have either uh, the motor areas in the brain light up when she's trying to say yes or uh, uh, fa uh, facial areas light up when she's trying to say no. So this is uh, a new kinds of communication met uh, methods that could be achieved for paralyzed people. Uh, all these uh, kind of cyborg technologies, uh, they don't sneak in from the, the military applications as you might have suspected but from a, a medical application. Um, okay, so what we have done is... Ah, okay, this is too late. I wanted to show you some present stuff. But, uh, okay, so what we have done is... Let's see what this is. Okay, I'll show you one video. So we have, we have done... Uh, we have connected people using this brain-computer interface to an immersive virtual reality in a way that allowed... Uh, for example, in this... Uh, uh, in this uh, work, a tetraplegic patient, a patient who is uh, paralyzed in four uh, uh, limbs, to navigate a virtual street. Um, for some reason, the 
וזה לא, זה גם לא מנגן, but uh, I will show you this uh, video later. I will get, in the end I have some videos that are online and I have all these versions online. As, as much time as you want I can show you some videos. But let, let me continue with the stories and we'll get to the video clips in the end. So, uh, and again, if you want uh, uh, details, of course we don't have time now. My, uh, my point would be that uh, these things are possible. Uh, but uh, you have to be careful because now you will see a lot of people on if you check out YouTube you'll see a lot of kind of gadgets that sell for a hundred dollars and allow you to operate things by uh, using your thoughts and uh, some scientists in uh, Germany I think have done a very uh, educational work where they took a mannequin uh, you know a booba from Halon Rava and they put a wet towel on the head of the mannequin and showed that it could use these hundred uh, dollar three hundred dollar devices to play video games just as well. So uh, you have to be careful of the placebo effect. You know, it's very easy to get all kinds of random noises from all kinds of sensors connected to your body and show that it's uh, connected to a video game or to a robot or to uh, you know, uh, the waves in the sea. But uh, you have to be careful distinguishing you know, the, the science and the peer-reviewed work from all kinds of uh, companies that are, are uh, uh, marketing up now. Uh, so the bottom line is it's possible, it's limited. This was using EEG. EEG, you place these electrodes on the scalp, which means that, um, which means that it's not, it's not obtrusive, it's not expensive. Uh, however, it's outside your skull, so it's very, very noisy. That is the main limitation. Okay. Now, of course, remember the whole goal of this is to disconnect completely your mind from your body and then allow you to control a remote body uh, by thought. Okay. Um, so then we have another project which is called the uh, VERE for Virtual Embodiment and Robotic Re-Embodiment where this image is taken from the research proposal and this robot is actually a partner in this project. Uh, we work with a group that has access to these, uh, there are very few such uh, humanoid robots in the world. And the idea is again that a person is uh, lying down connected to all kinds of devices, controlling a, a remote, a, a, either first an avatar in a virtual reality, and then a robot in uh, performing some uh, simple tasks. And this is what we promised in the proposal. And this is what uh, we have done uh, just recently. This is actually, so that there is a lot of progress in the project, very good uh, partners. This is our work. So. Uh, uh, in this case, the operation with the robot has three partners. Uh, we are kind of uh, producing it and doing the, the whole uh, research, but we are working with a group in the uh, Weizmann Institute who has access to an fMRI machine and to a French group that, you know, so far we practice with this little robot, okay, which is uh, kind of a child. This is practice until they allow us to play with this, uh, the real deal, you know. Um, Okay, so the idea, uh, this is a few months old, it's just be, uh, been accepted now to uh, the first paper to a conference will be presented in Rome uh, in June. So what you see uh, is a subject lying in an fMRI scanner. This is of course, uh, this is also non-obtrusive, it's not even radi there's no uh, radiation involved. However, as you can see, it's uh, not something that you can carry on with you uh, like a mobile phone, you have to lie down in this very, very expensive scanner. The advantage is that it gives us a very uh, a good spatial resolution of uh, things that are going on in your mind as you are experiencing things. Okay, so uh, arguably fMRI is one of the most uh, advanced techniques in showing us what happens inside the brain of a living person. There are ways to look at animals, there are ways to look at uh, people after they are dead. There are, uh, fMRI is one of the best ways to get an overall view of what happens inside a living person as they are experiencing all kinds of things. Okay, and what we have done is we tried to recognize simple commands such as moving left, right, forward, that was the first trial, uh, from this fMRI data and send them from uh, Rehovot to uh, France. And this is where I'm going to show you some uh, videos to start uh, summarizing. 
Um, okay. כן, אני... אולי פשוט נפתח בראוזר ו... כן, אני יודע שיש סאונד, ופשוט שזה אינטרנט בראוזר זה אני אוהב את Hi, this video describes our pilot experiments for controlling an avatar using real-time fMRI. The experiments are conducted in the fMRI scanner at the Weizmann Institute of Science. Most studies in real-time fMRI are neurofeedback studies in which the raw signals are just presented to the subject as abstract visual feedback as shown here. We are conducting such studies in Vare, but in this video we describe how we go beyond this state of the art to use online classification and virtual reality feedback. In our first pilot studies, the subject lying down in the scanner sees an avatar also lying down in the scanner. The subject imagines either left hand or right hand motion, and the system tries to decode this imagery and move the avatar's hands accordingly. Since the GLM contrast analysis is quite robust, subjects were able to control the avatar with very little training and with very high accuracy. Therefore, we are now conducting a more ambitious experiment in which the goal is to allow the subject's avatar to stand up and start exploring the world. The subject can use right-hand imagery to turn the avatar right, left-hand imagery to turn the avatar left, and feet imagery to move the avatar forward. Our preliminary results indicate that we can expect over 90% accuracy for this 3 plus problem. Our next goal would be to try to minimize the delay and extend the number of classes which would allow the subject to perform simple tasks using their avatar. This would be achieved by introducing more sophisticated machine learning techniques which are now being added into the system. When I was 10, my dad took me with him on a business trip to China. He introduced me to his business partner. As I went to introduce myself, I put my hand up to take his. Unfortunately... Okay, so what, you, what I tried to show you in the first video was kind of an explanation of how this works. And this was the first thing we did. And since we were where the subjects were successful, the next thing we did is allow them to control a, an avatar which is walking on a tropical island. Okay, and uh, again, the subject was uh, lying down in the fMRI scanner. If you can see in this video, it's not perfect control, but they are able to walk uh, along a quite uh, long uh, footpath in the jungle, and it's actually quite an immersive experience because you know, lie, they lie down there, it's dark, there's nothing to see, just the screen in front of them. Uh, so this was a uh, good progress because we found out that uh, it works in a continuous control. And now I will need your help to see maybe to go to the next uh, video and it's out of all of
Okay. So this is uh, uh, to conclude. Uh, the subject lies down in the FMR. I stammer in the Wiseman Institute. Okay. Uh, okay. So um, in the first stage, the idea. Uh, this is where I'll try to explain a little bit how it works. So in the first stage, we tell the sub this is uh, we try to locate exactly per person the areas in the brain that are used uh, to think about, uh, for example, right hand, left hand, feet, etc. So while this is uh, very uh, similar in all of us, in order to make it accurate, uh, we have to do it uh, just before the subject is trying to control the robot, because this would change you know, from person to person, but also from in the same person within days. So first we have like a minute of training, where and it's um, it's actually both systems are training to each other. The person is trying to achieve a more and more refined control of the system, and also the machine is trying to learn about the particular uh, patterns of activity in the subjects uh, in the person's brain. Okay. After uh, this was successful, uh, we did it. It's the, like the first time ever. So what you see here. Okay, um, so what, no, 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 hold on. <coughs> okay, so, okay, so, okay. So what you see here is, on the left, you see the subject lying down in Rehovot. Uh, then the kind of thoughts or the <coughs> brain activity patterns of the subject are read. <laughs> you know technology. It's, uh, <laughs> it's responding to my brain. So the person lies down in Rehovot. The particular thought patterns are broadcasted to France. Now, in France, we have this small robot. Uh, it's a very, you know, this is the small one. This is only 60,000 euros. So there's this. This is why they have this guy who's holding the little robot with a with a strap, because if it falls down, it might break. Okay, um, and then the other guy is kind of uh, signaling to the subject where to go. And we tried all kinds of things, first to try to navigate in all kinds of eight patterns, and then we hit this uh, teapot and the subject had to find it. Okay? Now, um, this, the video cameras from the robot are fed back to, to Israel, so the subject who is lying down in the robot sees uh, what you see there on the bottom left. Okay, what you see on the right is the brain activity. This was again very simple. Um, what, what you see on the right is the brain activity of three different thoughts, left, right, and forward. Okay, so again, on the one hand, I want to show you that it is possible. On the other hand, it's still very limited. And uh, in fact, yesterday we had a breakthrough because we were able to decode uh, speed. Uh, people could imagine, just imagine, without moving anything, just imagine moving f uh, slowly, medium speed, or high speed, and we could decode the speed from the brain activities. And this is already... Uh, uh, an interesting uh, breakthrough. So this is kind of the state of the art uh, where things are. Uh, there are a few more groups uh, working on these things uh, around the world, but this is more or less the best you can do. Uh, on the other hand, it's, um, I don't know if you are all aware, but uh, neuroscience and applied neuro brain technologies now is a huge industry. Um, we're talking about 50,000 people in, uh, in the largest uh, neuroscience conference in the United States, and all these 50,000 people, so there must be about 100,000 people doing all kinds of brain studies using the top-of-the-art technology, so, you know, uh, we're talking about billions and billions of dollars of trying to decode the, the, the human brain and manipulate it in all kinds of ways, you know, uh, Mayan Ruti showed you some stuff, you, have, you haven't talked about deep brain stimulation, which is uh, now about 100,000 people around the world have uh, chronic implants in their brain. For, uh, which are, uh, of course, uh, controlled by quite uh, sophisticated computers. 
So the bottom line is kind of it's already there, it's already around us, and it's uh, uh, time for questions. <laughs>